Okay, so we will start. Hello, hello, hello. So we will start the new session with uh, agile and lean practices. So, and that's good because I like to see more talk about the company doing small talk stuff. I will just check over. Okay, thank you, Steph. Uh, so, for something completely different, uh, we will be mainly talking about uh, how we're doing software projects. So, we will be talking about agile and lean practices at Mediagenix. Uh, we'll be first talking about um, introducing Mediagenix so that you know the context in which we work, because that explains a lot of the, the reasons why we're adopting uh, agile and lean uh, methodologies. And then we'll move on towards the, the agile development. So, introducing Mediagenix, let's start with ourselves. I'll try not to mix up this this time. This is Maria and I'm Michael. Uh, Maria is a software engineer and, and I'm the competence manager. Uh, we're both practitioners of Agile and Lean practices. We're, not, we're definitely not gurus. So, we will be talking from our own personal experience how we are adopting uh, those, those methodologies and what we think is good about them and also a little bit about how we struggle getting them really implemented. So first let's uh, talk about the company. Uh, we are, we're a product company. We are, have one product called What's On, uh, written in, in visual works. Uh, it's a planning software for TV broadcasters. There's more or less 120 employees at the company. Uh, and we exist, the, co uh, the product exists for 21 years. Uh, our Headquarters are located in Brussels, and we also have an office in Macedonia. Um, but our customers are, are all over the world. We're mainly uh, located. Our customers are mainly located within Europe. We also have customers in North America, Australia, uh, the east of the world. So uh, all around the world. Um, so 50 customers. And all of these TV stations, the radio stations, and the only mount operators have different workflows, and that's why we customize our product to really deliver to what they need. And as a company, we want to offer the maximum value to our customers. So this means that we want to have a short time to deliver, and I'm sure that small talk is happening there for us. Uh, but we also want to have frequent communications with the customer. What do they want? and uh, try to be flexible in, in our answers to, uh, to that. Projects at Mediagenics can really differ a lot. Um, a, a very small project can take several days, and the very big ones can take up to two to three years. And all, that also means that the, the team composition will be very different. We all always uh, have cross-functional teams, meaning that we have at least one person of four functions available, a project manager, a software engineer, a functionalist, and, a, and someone from customer service. Customer service are the people who test the, the product before, before they deliver it to the customer, but they're also the ones, uh, they're also the ones who, who do second line help desk. So when the customer has a question about the product that they can't answer, and they will eventually end up with customer service. So that's, that's it for introducing Mediagenix. Let's move on to Agile development. So first, a general explanation. And as is usual with, with talking about Agile development, we talk about what came before, and that's the, the waterfall methodology. And in the waterfall methodology, you have really well-defined steps in the process. Uh, this is an example has five requirements, design, implementation, uh, validation, so testing the product and eventually getting the product uh, live and going into maintenance. Within a waterfall methodology, uh, you start with a, with a big set of requirements and they're, they're all requirements and you will move them all to the design phase. So uh, once they're all designed, you will move them all to the developers who will re, uh, implement them. When it, uh, all the requirements are, are written, are made into to code, they will go to the testing department, they will test everything, 
and eventually the whole product will be will be shipped to the customer. Uh, this is waterfall, it's uh, sequential. It also means that you have a large time to market because you have really have to go with everything to all of these steps and you go only through each of the steps one by one. And it also means that you get late feedback from the customer only when, when uh, it's uh, delivered to the customer. To the customer, the customer can give you feedback about how he likes what you've done for them. So you're getting late feedback. Uh, it's not uh, okay. uh, I was going to say it's not all bad, but there's some more bad news. Um, with waterfall, it also means that you can't change requirements or you can't remove requirements from from the initial phase. They're all set at the beginning, and they remain fixed. Uh, so if you want to change some things, you go through the whole process, then the customer complains, and you, you start a new project where you will make the changes that are required. Uh, so I was saying it's not all bad, bad news. In the 70s when it was introduced, it really, really introduced a well-defined process to do project management. Um, I think it's also good for stable or small projects, but when we look into the real world, there are not so many stable projects where the customer never changes his mind. And one thing that nowadays is also not very much like is that the management makes all the decisions. They decide which, on which requirements uh, they should be worked, and when it's once decided, you don't go back to that. So that's uh, the old ways. Uh, HL development. It's uh, well. You also have a lot of. Uh, you have also a lot of defined steps in the process, but there you will work in smaller iterations. So you have your set of requirements and you will say, let's make a first small iteration and we will move uh, the first requirements through the process and deliver those to the customer. And then the customer already has a first small set of requirements. After that, you can reprioritize your requirements and now you do have the, the option to, to change a requirement or you can add out a requirement uh, and then you can perhaps move, uh, move on with, with the latest requirements. And then you can take those, move it into iteration 2, deliver those until finally everything is delivered. With agile development it also means that you don't have all your requirements in one stage. You can have them scattered all over the, the different phases. Um, so, what's different about Agile is uh, it's iterative, incremental, I would even say interactive. Uh, you can adopt your planning, it uh, gives a lot more flexibility. You can react to changes much faster, and mostly you will need self-organizing and cross-functional teams to deliver that. And all this will, will make sure that you as a company can deliver more value to the customer, and that's exactly what we are aiming for. Now the first uh, Agile methodology that we started applying is extreme programming. Okay, so how much would you pay for a software development team that would do what you want? What if they could also tell you how much it would cost so that you can decide what to do and what to defer on your way to your deadline? You also get a quality software, a robust area of tests that will support the project to its entire life cycle, and a clear, up-to-date view of the project status. Best of all, you can change your mind about anything and every time. So, extreme programming is a simple set of common sense practices that when used together, they can really give you most of what I've just mentioned. XP was the first of the Agile methodologies that we started working with and experimenting with. So uh, every software project will cost you something. And it depends on the quality, time, speed, and the scope. And as I said, XP is a set of ideas. And each of them influences differently on these three aspects. So let's see them. The first one is the on-site customer. So, People from this role, they choose what will deliver business value. They choose what to do first. They define the tests 
that will show that the system really does what it needs to. So the idea is <coughs> always to have someone from the customer sitting next to you, close to you, with who you can talk with all the time. And this, of course, affects the three of the aspects. But this was not really feasible for us, so we had something in between called the functional analyst. And our customers are worldwide, so the functional analysts, they travel a lot, and they spend like 30 to 40% of the time at the customer, and the rest of the time they spend it with the project and with the development. The next one, sorry, are the user stories. So the customers, they express what must be done using user stories. What are the user stories? User stories are small pieces of functionality just written on a paper. They are the requirements that the programmer should implement. And you can choose the user stories with great flexibility. And this increases the three of the aspects. The next one is the communication. So the communication between the customer and the programmer is essential. A written specification can take a long time to write, and they don't communicate well. So what is best? Better and much more effective is to have a short communication and conversation between the customer and the programmer uh, as the project goes on. So the more time the customer and the programmer spend together, the better things go. Immediately answering of questions is of an immense value. I, as a software developer, I think that this is really crucial. So I, honestly, I develop more quicker and with more quality the story. If, an ans if I get an answer the same day, maybe the same hour, instead of waiting for three to four days for an answer, I lose track of what I wanted to ask. And, of course, this affects the three of the aspects, the communication. The next one is the simple design. So, make everything as simple as possible. The simplest thing that could work, implement it. So, no duplication of code. Minimum number of methods. Minimum number of classes. And code written like this is really the light of work. And it affects to all the three of the aspects. The next one is the pair programming. So the idea is two programmers side by side work on the same problem. Usually they are called the driver and the partner and they should be with the same level of knowledge unless uh, the pair programming is used with learning so the driver should have uh, less experience and the uh, partner more experience so that he can lead the way. Uh, unfortunately, we don't use pair programming a lot, only with really difficult uh, things. Uh, and it's a bit uh, difficult to explain to the higher management that the time we want to invest in quality will eventually pay itself back. And of course, uh, the senior programmers don't like it. And to be honest, I think it's really exhausting. But it affects the quality. Uh, the next one. Um, is unit test. So, test everything that could possibly break. Test everything using automated tests. And all the tests should run 100% of the time. The sooner you detect the problem, the sooner you will fix the problem. The sooner you fix the problem, less time you spend on it. And of course, this affects the quality, the time, and the speed. The next one is test-driven development. Uh, we only use it when we are fixing bugs. Uh, with quotes only then we know the exact scenario that we can test, but it improves the quality. Uh, the next one is the continuous integration. So integrate as often as possible. Integrate and, and test the whole system multiple times per day. Uh, it's really easier to find something that we've built like uh, two days before 
instead of maybe 20 weeks before. And uh, we have an automatic build and test system, uh, which gives us faster feedback about how we are doing. This, of course, affects the quality, the time, and the speed. Um, refactoring, together with the simple code design, uh, we use it to uh, enlarge the system or when we want to do that. So extend the system only on it. This uh, uh, increases the time and the speed. The next one is the collective code ownership. So a lot of people are afraid to change other people's code. If they work on a program alone, they, they, don't, they don't have fears. They, they're uh, changing it all the time without uh, thinking a lot. But if they have to change other people's code, first they have to go and ask the programmer, can I change your class? How would be the, that impact? And so on. And here's the fear factor. But what if the code is owned by the whole team? Then the fear factor will be gone. And the idea behind this is I'm not afraid to change my own code, and it's all mine. And of course, it affects the quality, team, time, and speed. Uh, the next one is the inter uh, iteration plan. Yeah. Uh, so short iterations two to three weeks, select the work that will maximize the business value and deliver it at the end of the iteration. Uh, with XP, there is not much about planning. It's really light planning. Only talks with the customers, deciding what to do and what will be difficult or not. So for us, this was not enough. But it affects on the scope. So at MediaGenics, we like definitely the user stories. As we program, we don't really work in pairs, only for difficult parts. For example, when we are implementing um, the financial module or when we are doing really big upgrades. We use simple design plus refactoring to keep the design quality high. And we integrate all the time so that everyone can improve the code if it's needed. So conclusion about the XP. Uh, an XP project succeeds if the customer chooses the right things that will be delivered on time and estimated by the programmer. So everything comes down to the picture shown here. So the customer defines the value, but uh, the customer has to know how much it would cost. So the programmer, based on the experience, estimates the cost, and then the customer chooses again what will be delivered, and the programmer builds it. So, as you can see, everything is really focused on the programmer. Deliver high quality software as soon as possible. And it's really tempting to put pressure on the programmer. For example, work harder, do it better, maybe stay longer. And uh, if you want software written by people who are under stress, then do this. If you want software with bad quality, then do this. But if you want to the best combination of the best features with good quality, then you have to manage the scope. And uh, at MediaGenix, there are not only the developers, so there is more room for improvement. And as you can see from the triangle, the problem is with the scope. It's not that much focused on the scope. So after working with XP, we quickly came to Scrum. OK. So we needed something more to, um, to focus on, on the scope and actually on project management in, in general. Uh, so Scrum really does that, this. It uh, also focuses on the team. Uh, how does it do this? Well, it introduces the concept of a sprint. It uh, time boxes deliveries by introducing these sprints. And a sprint is nothing more than a fixed period, uh, somewhere between two weeks and eight weeks. We chose uh, for two weeks, and every two weeks it's always the same. At the beginning of the two weeks, you have a sprint definition, deciding on what you will work the next two weeks. Then you actually do the work as a team. Then at the end of the two weeks, you make a sprint retrospective at, uh, with the whole team, uh, sometimes also with the customer, uh, saying uh, what went well and what didn't go so well to, to learn from that. 
and then you also do a delivery. Of course, uh, in real life situation, not every customer wants a delivery by, uh, every two weeks. That's why we sometimes didn't do a delivery or we had an internal delivery to simulate that. Um, Scrum also assumes a fixed team. I will get back to that later. So how, how can you make a sprint definition? How can you define what you will work on for the next two weeks? Well, it comes down to estimating the user stories, user stories that were introduced uh, during extreme programming. Um, so ideally you have a, 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 a reference story and for, uh, you estimate it, for instance, as three story points. You work with points. And then when you have a new user story, you will either say it's more difficult or, or it will take longer or it's easier and it will take less. And then you will assign one, two, up until five uh, story points to it. And like that, you will estimate every uh, user story. Um, once you have the, all these estimated uh, user stories, you can start measuring the team velocity. In the beginning, you will have to guess. But uh, once you start working as a fixed team on a project, you can measure how many uh, story points the team is able uh, to handle within those two weeks. So, um, for instance, the first time you measured, uh, you saw it was 40, and then for the next sprint, you will say, say during the sprint definition, we will try to, to uh, find user stories worth of 40 points, <coughs> and then you will do the next sprint. The big advantage of using these story points and the velocity is that you will have less overestimation because we all tend, well, in general, we tend to overestimate. Suppose I want to get from here back to the hotel, then I know I will need to assemble everything. Let's say it will take me two minutes, but I'm estimating, so I will say, let's take five minutes, then I will need to go downstairs, wait for the bus. should take me 15 minutes because every 15 minutes there is a bus. Then you say maybe take half an hour and so on and so on. You always tend to put a little bit more time during estimation. And when you're working with story points, you can, you can really eliminate this. A negative point is that you assume that, that mainly the team should be fixed. Um, because once you, once you add people to the team, then uh, normally you should be able to, to handle more, more stories and more story points. Uh, at the end of every sprint, sprint you have a, a retrospective where the team gathers together. Uh, you also update your team velocity because the team learns. The team might also change. And so that you know at the next sprint definition how many user stories are we uh, will we be able to, to handle. Ideally, at this time, around this time, you will also give a demo to the customer uh, for us, it's mostly with, with uh, conference meetings so that they can see what you are making and that they can give you fast feedback about how the, the, process, the project is going on. Maybe the customer is not happy or maybe the customer will give you an extra boost by saying, great job, keep on doing this. Um, so as we said in the beginning of Scrum, it's focused on, on the project management with uh, the introduction of the sprint and, and sprint definition but this also allows you allows the project managers to introduce burn down charts. <coughs> Suppose that uh, you have wor uh, work worth of 1,900 pounds. You know your team velocity. Then you can really start measuring when you will be able to deliver. And if that might be too late, if you wouldn't be on time, <coughs> then you can add people to the team, which will change the velocity. But you can make a guesstimate there uh, to make sure that that you will get on time. Another artifact of, of uh, Scrum is the daily stand-up. The whole team gathers the whole uh, every day uh, around a board that projects the work. And they talk about three things. Every participant of, of the, the stand-up talks about three things. What am I working on? How long do I think it, I still need to co uh, complete this? And am I stuck and do I need the help of somebody else? Um, at uh, Mediagenics, we, we actually didn't use the velocity as it was because most of the project teams were still estimating in, in hours and days but I think the velocity would have been a nice thing but by introducing this concept of sprints we were definitely able to deliver more value to the customer and it was a big step ahead. 
So Scrum is, is more on fo focused on the project management and what you can have of this. Michael, you presented in the very beginning that you are spread between Brussels and Skopje. Yes. And if you just go one slide back, how do you handle the stand-up meetings uh, okay. with this yeah. 1,500 kilometers distance? Yeah, uh, actually Scrum is, is, is a, a project management tool that we used to. Uh, the, the next part by Maria will talk about Kanban. Uh, and then you will see electronic boards, and, and also uh, we we will uh, we have um, video meetings. So um, that was it for Scrum. Uh, the remote thing will slightly be shown by Maria. Okay. So the next agile methodology that we started to work with is Kanban. And what is the first characteristic of Kanban? It's a pool system. So. You only start to work on an item if there is a capacity available. And compare this with Scrum. Scrum is a typical push system. So you have like a big backlog of items and you're pushing them towards the system to meet a deadline. You're trying to solve them all because you have a deadline. And Kanban compared to Scrum, it's a push and you only pulling item and you start only to work on an item if a capacity is available, if you have the time to work on it. So, everyone from each phase, they know at which speed they work. So, for example, the persons in column C, they know at uh, which uh, speed they have to deliver the value, so they gradually pull work from column B. The same thing is with the persons from column B. They know at which uh, speed they work and uh, at what time they have to push the, to give the items to column C, so they are gradually working, uh, pulling items from column A. So a pull system is don't start if a capacity is not available. So let's take a look at one example. Uh, let's say that in the design phase we have a capacity of two people, and in, in the implementation phase a capacity is three. And everyone is working on some items. But after a while, uh, let's say that one of the items is blocked. So this item is blocked and this person can't work on anything. But he can pull an item from the buffer and won't be idle. So if the person is idle, the, the idea is pull an item and continue with your work. But there can be an extreme case like a lot of blocked items, a lot of issues just waiting here. And let's assume that to finish one item, it takes like a day. And if they stay here, the items longer, it's obvious that they won't be fixed on time. And what that means? That lead time increases. And that's bad. Because we want short lead times. So here comes the second characteristic of Kanban. And that's limit the work in progress. With limiting the work in progress, the lead time shortens. Uh, what does this mean? That you will put limits on each of the columns, and in the column, uh, in the design column, for example, the limit will be four, and implementation three, for example, and no more items can be pulled in that columns. Uh, but be careful. In the first week of <coughs> when you're Limiting the work on progress, a lot of people will think that there is some space for negotiating. So they can come to you, and this also happened to me, like, okay, I know that you don't have time, you're totally uh, uh, covered, but let's, can you please take a look at this small uh, story? It's a really small one, only five minutes. But this is a bit tricky, because how would I know that it's really a short one? What if I get stuck? Then the other items that are in my column will be blocked. And what is the result of that? Long lead time. So that's not good. You have to say no and to learn to say no. And also everyone should learn to play by the rules. So when you're defining a limit, it should really be a limit. After you uh, limited the work in progress, the next thing that you have to do is prioritize your work. So with prioritization, 
you will pull the items that will give most value. The next thing that you also have to take into account are the frequent releases. Why? Because frequent releases build trust. Uh, more frequent releases with external teams, of course, build trust. So reducing the width limits shortens the lead time. Shorter lead time, more working code can be released more frequently. And uh, trust is really difficult to define, but trust is event-driven. So small but frequent uh, gestures uh, build more trust than larger made only occasionally. And to give, now I'm going to give one example about trust. It has nothing to do with software development. And I read it in one book and I think it's really good. So what do you think? what women think when they go out on a date with a guy for the first time. And let's assume that they're having a good time, they had a nice time, but then the guy disappears for two weeks, and after two weeks he shows with a bunch of flowers and an apology. And let's compare this guy with another guy who would take the time to, after the dead night, to write a text message saying like, we had a nice time, uh, I really enjoyed your company, can we see tomorrow and can I call you? And it turns out that he really called her the next day. They would definitely pre prefer the guy with the text message. I would. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the people, the women here prefer the guy with the message. <laughs> so. Small gestures often cost nothing but build more trust than a large one, expensive one, given only occasionally. And so it's the same thing with the software development. Delivering small but frequent high quality releases definitely builds more trust than putting out larger less often. The third characteristic about Kanban is creating the flow. So everything is Kanban is the flow. And how are we doing this? Offer with buffers. Ideally, we don't need them, but in real life, it's not possible to expect that the people from uh, analysis and development and testing will um, work on one item with the same speed. And that's why we need the buffers. And we have to be careful because two, more, two small uh, buffers will give a, uh, a bit idle time to the employees and uh, big buffers, little big buffers, will increase the lead time. Uh, so let's see how we can create the flow with Kamba. Uh, so let's have the buffers already prepared and let's assume that for processing an item in phase B, it takes one day and it's the same time for in phase C. But for a phase B, it takes a little bit longer, like day and a half. And uh, be careful, we don't know this in advance, how fast the things will go the first time. And clearly, the buffer before the phase B will come to, uh, will become to overflow, it will start to overflow. And also C will stay idle for some time. What does this mean? Long lead time. And that's not good. But what is good about this picture? It shows the bottleneck immediately. If you ask your employees, they will all tell you that they, are, they have a lot of work. They all have a lot of work. But if you present a picture like this four year situation, you will see where is the problem immediately and you will notice the bottleneck immediately. It's the phase B. What can we do? Let's reset the cadence to the speed of our phase B. What will happen? We will have the flow. So no buffers overloaded. But phase A and phase C will stay idle for a certain time. But what will uh, Kanban do with this idle time? it will create good. How? 
with the continuous improvements. So what can people from phase A and phase C do while they are idle? Uh, they can attend the training. Uh, they can work on development tools. They can give training. They can even help people from phase B if they are capable. Uh, the fourth characteristic about Kanban is the visibility and transparency. Uh, how we do this? Uh, with the help of the Kanban board. So at the daily stand-ups, we gather around the board and everyone knows about the workflow, everyone is involved and can propose solutions. Compared to the Scrum board, at Scrum we all gather around but we all talk about everything. So I'm working on this, I'm working on this, I'm working on that. And with Kanban, we only talk about the problems, only about the uh, items that are blocked. And everyone is encouraged to help and to make improvements and to give solutions. That's the main re uh, difference. Uh, in MediaGenix, we use Jira. It's an electronic system. We use colors, dots, icons for the person that are working on the item. Uh, the board is also divided uh, on the work type, so we have support box, standard box, standard items. Uh, we have an expedite line, uh, and that means uh, fix the problem as soon as possible. We have also the buffers, so the columns to be functional and tested, to be implemented, uh, to be developed. Uh, also, on some boards, we already introduced the VIP limits, so for example, there the maximum is three. We also have a really good uh, search criteria so that we can easily see everything. So at Metagenix, we definitely like the Kanban boards, the whip limits, the transparency, but we still need to grow and adapt Kanban, but we seem to like it so far. So a conclusion about Kanban, it's a pull system rather than a push system, and you're delivering values more efficiently. But be careful, Kanban is not intended to be a, a quick fix, but an uh, investment that will be longer, but it will mature and will give more culture to your organization. Uh, first question, uh, how long do I still have? Five minutes, okay. You can, if you need a bit more, you can make it more. Ah, okay, thank you. Uh, the last thing that we've started uh, using is very recently, it's about lean thinking. And lean thinking is about five principles. First, you identify the value, and it's always the customer who uh, identifies the value. So you work for the customer, and he will tell you what's important. And then the second is you map the value stream. So to deliver that value, you need to go through a certain process, and then you map that, that value stream. A third thing is that you will start implementing to a, creating a flow in that so that every bug, everything along the value stream flows steadily. A fourth thing is that you will uh, establish a pool thing so where the, the persons who are available to do work will start pulling for the work. And the last thing is that uh, you will try to do your work as good as possible so that you, you uh, try to eliminate errors as much as possible. As you might have seen, uh, a lot of these things are also uh, uh, there in Kanban, and Kanban is actually on the border between Agile and Lean. Um, so with Lean Thinking, we use Lean Thinking for uh, two situations, uh, problem solving and, and breakthrough events. Uh, problem solving events are more smaller initiatives where the starting point is mainly more, more known, and you will only make minor changes and the results will also happen in less, less bigger improvements than with breakthrough events, where you usually have first your starting point, you will introduce big changes, but lean thinking uh, offers a lot of <coughs> techniques that are the same for, for both of the situations. I'm only going to talk about one, which is the A3, and an A3 can really guide you through one of these uh, continuous improvement events. So you see uh, nine boxes, so from top left until uh, bottom right, and when you start thinking about uh, a value stream, you might uh, see some things that are happening, and you describe in descriptive words 
what you would like to improve. And then you do that in box one. In box two, you start measuring really uh, how, how good are we doing. And that's box two. So you really have a well-defined starting point. In box three, with the team that will work on the, the change event, you start thinking about how good should we be, not just I want a 25% increase, but no, if you think uh, a speed fix should happen within a day, then there's no point in going from 30 days to 20 days, no, you will go from, you will say the aim is to go from 30 days to one day. Now that you have in, in, in numbers, uh, things like where you are and where you want to go to, then you can do a gap analysis in box four, saying, thinking with the team, uh, what what are we not doing so that prevents us from, from getting there? So we have, you do a gap analysis. Uh, in box five, you, uh, uh, you propose a solution to the problem. In box six, you, do, uh, you describe some uh, experiments that you will do to see if, if your solution will really solve the problem. And then box seven is a bit of a project management. So while you're improving, you, you follow up on who is responsible for what. And then in box eight, well, this is an unfinished uh, A3. Uh, in box eight, you hope to, to really get where you want it to. So at the end of, of the, the chains event, the chains initiative, box eight and box three should really be the same. So you really want to get where you are. If not, then you have to go through several boxes again and improve again. And box nine is a retrospective. Uh, retrospective is something uh, that's typical for both agile and lead. So this A3 can really guide you through these uh, change events and it really gives you a well-defined step-by-step plan where you talk to the stakeholders because that's also important. You really go and talk to the people who are doing the work. Um, it's an iterative process sometimes. You, well, the logic step is you go from box one to box two, two three, and so on. But sometimes you have to, to go back to say, oh, we're not, we're going to get there. You, you take a step back. Uh, and by communicating to the team, you really help uh, convincing all the stakeholders, the people who need to do the work, the management, the customer, and so on. And I think it also helps as a learning tool, the, the Deming cycle, uh, plan, do, check, act. Uh, so people learn from this. Um, so if you have a, a change event and, and what uh, you, um, you suggest some improvements, then you will increase your performance over time and, and, and uh, to make sure that, that you are at a, still at a higher uh, performance, you will introduce some standard work to make sure that you don't fall back in your old ways of working. Can be a lot of things, can be templates, can be a Kanban board, uh, can be uh, introducing a kind of meetings, skipping a meetings, introducing more steps in a workflow, skipping some work, uh, some steps in a workflow and so on. So uh, at Mediagenix, uh, well, we just start uh, applying these things, but we really like the things, the visual tools that, that uh, Lean Thinking is, uh, is uh, giving us. And about the A3, I really like the step-by-step -step process to help you focus on, on the thing that you want to do right now. Um, First time I started adopting uh, Lean Thinking, I think it was really confronting. You really start about looking at how it is now, and, and sometimes you think, oh, this is not possible. Does it really take us 30 days to do this? Can be, it's, it's only five minutes work, but, but then, yeah, that's really confronting. But if you apply a no-blame culture, then you might get very nice results with this. Uh, so to conclude, uh, we use, still use extreme programming for things to improve the quality and, and the, the time and speed uh, for the programmer. Uh, we don't use Scrum anymore. We moved on to Kanban as a, as a project management tool. And lead thinking is something that we use for process improvements. Um, I think uh, we're using a little bit of, of a lot of different technologies. And, I, and I, when I talk to other people, it's always the same. They mix up things and, and you have to make it work. And the combination with a small talk environment in which you, where you can develop a lot of things fast, I think that gives you really uh, the chance to deliver value to the customer really fast.
Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Yes. I thought that was the most honest description of pair programming that I've ever heard in any of these talks, that if I heard correctly, you see the value when you do it, but you find it exhausting yeah. and the senior programmers say much the same. Um, if you have anything more to say on that, I'd love to hear it uh, now or over dinner or whatever, because I think that's, that is something many of us recognize. Thank you. I'll give the word back this time. Okay, so now everybody should get it. So, so I will explain you how we will proceed for the award.